the first verse. On the first verse, 498. Here we go. Sing the Lord, press the heart, Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, rise and bless it. He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory of the second verse. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a star, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all sing Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory on the last verse. Our word to the Christ before us, soon his beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. That was good. Let's sing the chorus once again. And then it says, we'll sing and shout. Okay, so don't be afraid. Don't worry about what note that is, A, B, C, D, whatever it is. Just shout the victory. Ready? Here we go. Let's try that. Just the chorus on 498. Starting out with when we all ready? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll see and shout victory. That's wonderful. I love hearing God's people just praising the Lord. And yes, we're going to shout. What a glorious day that's going to be when we say farewell to the world. We're up in heaven with Jesus. No more problems, no more pain, no more suffering, no more separation. But we start to shout it out. And so as we prepare for that, and that's why I think the church just got to get excited. And just do a little thing outside the box here once in a while. Just the fact of just one day realizing that every day we come to church, we're preparing for heaven. So for the Bob, for the Jeffrey, we so kind of come. We'll pick up our morning offering. Remember this. We tied you through around so you give offerings to prove our love. Let's be faithful to God because God is faithful to us. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, Brother Jeff, can you take us to the Lord's throne? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you with honor, praise, and glory. I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the ultimate sacrifice made for all of us. And dear Lord, today as we're in your house worshiping you with word and song, uh, think about the people over there in the Middle East and everything that's going on. Oh, I'd like to pray for both sides. I want to pray for the people that had nothing to do with what happened to Israel. And they're, they're dealing with it because of the people that they allowed to govern them, use them as shields. It's terrible. It's awful what's going on. Lord, I know that you're in control and you're still on your throne. And you're going to take care of your people. And you're going to find those that did what they did. And we're going to eradicate them from the base of the earth finally once and for all because all they want to do is cause mayhem it's evil incarnate and it needs to be dealt with and it should swift and dear lord we ask that you watch out for all those that are in harm's way and you take and you keep them safe dear heavenly father we ask that you bless those that give today and that blessing go forth and bless others we ask all these things in jesus name Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
praise the Lord. The Lord is a shelter in a time of storm. Let's sing that number 263. Hymn number 263 in our hymnals. Let's all stand once again. <laughs> On the first verse. The Lord's our rock in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Savior, whatever ill we die, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of On the second bird, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears of harm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On the last verse. Oh, lucky my no wreck to fear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our help forever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, you're sounding good. Number 106, hymn number 106. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart, every word. <clears throat> Tell me the story of Jesus, for I love my heart every word. Tell me the story of precious, sweet as an ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his word. Glory to God. Yeah. 
Very, very basic message this morning about the gospel and why it's important to be saved. And so, uh, say, I'm already saved. What, what is it? How does it affect me? Well, the Bible says no man lives himself and no man dies himself. We all know people that do not, do not know Christ as personal Savior or have no desire to know about Christ, but one day either they get saved, they won't, they're going to stand before Jesus at the, um, the judgment seat of Christ and be rewarded for those things done in our bodies or the great white throne or at the very end they're going to be cast into a place called hell where God says, depart from me, I never knew you. I'd much rather, and although I don't want to go through the judgment seat of Christ, I'd much rather stand before Jesus, who is my advocate, than stand before an angry God because people did not receive him as Savior. And so John chapter 3, verse 36 says this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, the aspect of everlasting life is how long does it last? Everlasting. And so, once saved, always saved is important. At the moment that you come to know Christ, personal Savior, you are saved forever. So what if I do bad things? God knows that. But he still is willing to forgive us of our sins and make us his children. But he says this, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But... The wrath of God abideth on him. But the wrath of God abideth on him. We're going to look at this subject as why is it important to be saved? Why is it important to be saved? He says, He that believeth not the Son of the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord, although this would be a simple message, Lord, help me to, to be able to speak as if you were standing in my stead and say the things that you would say to encourage us to all understand that if we're not saved here, that people would get saved. But Lord, we all have loved ones, friends, co-workers, people that we know are neighbors who don't know Christ. And Father, give us that burden to understand that it doesn't matter what denomination they are because the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that, that you'd use this message to challenge us and direct us, encourage us where we remain. Father, those who accident will be saying, tell me the story of Jesus. Such a simple and great story. And Lord has so much involved in that. Let Jim Fryer sit down and Jesus Christ take over. And may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be truly acceptable unto you. 
God, direct our steps today, Lord. May we be able to say it's been good to be in the house of God. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. He says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of, wrath of God abideth on him. The aspect of the wrath of God. Say, well, how bad is the wrath of God? Look at Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. It's the story about Jesus being on the cross. And we know the story about Jesus being beaten, cat and nine tails 39 times, having his beard plucked out, having the crown of thorns beaten to his head, being mocked, beaten, despised, paraded down the Via Della Rosa, down the riddle of Jerusalem, walked up Calvary's mountain, laid on the cross willingly, allowed them to put the nails in his hands and to his feet, and after that happened, he cried out to God multiple times, seven different times on the cross. The wrath of God is so bad that even when we see a movie that was put out in, I think it's 2004, does not even touch the hem of the garment of how bad Jesus was beaten. And we see in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 says this. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fact of the wrath of God is this. Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God, the only one that had the ability to be able to satisfy God's judgment. Yes, he got beat. Yes, he got humiliated. Yes, he went through all kinds of pain. But the wrath of God is enveloped in this one statement. Why have you forsaken me? And that word forsaken is in this picture, which is to me is I cannot understand how a mother can carry a child for nine months, give birth. And that word forsaken is if you took that baby and you walked and you put that baby at a doorstep and you turned your back on that baby to never see that baby again. That's forsaken. How could anyone turn their back on someone that you nurtured for nine months and gave birth and all the pain and all the things you went through and be able to walk away. That's the word forsaken. God Almighty had to turn his back on Jesus Christ because at this point, all the pain, all the judgment, all the suffering of hell on earth was placed upon Jesus so that we can be forgiven. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Now, if we don't want to experience the wrath of God, we've got to understand, go to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. And we're going to go through a bunch of different scriptures here this morning. And if you want to, we have a video that will be on um, the uh, Facebook, the King James um, website that we have, the, the Facebook app that's on there. This will be on there if you want to show your friends. Or if you want to get those scripture verses later on, but Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Say, what is sin? Look at and hold your place here in Romans chapter 3. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. For all have sinned. Hebrews chapter 10. We know verse 25 where it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But verse 26 gives us a definition of when do we understand what sin is. For if we sin willfully, which means you know the difference between right and wrong. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. So we have been told and explained what is right and what is wrong. And we willfully turn our back on truth and willfully choose to escape truth and choose uh, the opposite, it says this. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This is, this is commonly known as the age of accountability. Say, what is that? Is, is there a specific age that everyone needs to get saved at? No, there isn't, because each child, each person, based upon... Um, their knowledge based upon their culture,
based upon other factors, maybe younger or maybe older, based upon a variety of different situations. When, we, when I was uh, going to Bible college in Oklahoma City, myself and another man, we taught an educatively slow class uh, in Sunday school and church. And these folks were, were from different homes that many of them were in their 40s through 60s, but had an education level of about four or five years old. Some of them six or seven, around that time. So it didn't matter what size the body is. What matters is their mental faculties, the ability to understand. And so our job was to take the Bible and teach the Bible, not at an adult level, but bring it down to that level of um, mental ability to understand. And we taught all kinds of things about that. But the aspect about this, it doesn't matter if you're 3, 4, 5, or you can be 50, 60 years old, but once you understand the difference between right and wrong, and we choose not to go down the right path, but choose to make bad decisions, a wrong path that goes against the scriptures because that's the authority, then we become accountable for our sins. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Say, so what happens if a child who has never heard the gospel, doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, they are still covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why all these young people, these, these babies that have been aborted, and all these people that have been slain as innocents, they're covered by the blood, hence they're up in heaven right now. Thank God for that. God says you've got to reach the threshold of understanding right and wrong. And when you willingly choose the wrong decision and go against the authority, which is the word of God, then you have sinned. Now, there's a variety of different other uh, definitions of sin, but here's the basic thing is that here's the authority, God's word, and in God's word it says you have to make a choice. You have to be taught. That's the value of, of being taught the word of God. Now, I grew up in a Catholic home. One of the things that used to be said is that if you never reach a, a Catholic, by the time they turn six or seven years old, you'll never reach them because every night, I can remember even when I was in have kindergarten back then, but even before that, we'd get down every night and we'd pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And we go every night we did. It didn't matter if we came home from the bowling alley at 2 o'clock in the morning, we got down on our knees. I was going to Catholic school, so I was taught Catholic dogma. I went to Catholic Mass as an altar boy. So my life was enveloped in the Catholic teachings. And many of them that I, t that I learned, I still use today. You see, they teach that we sin. Everybody's a sinner. And they teach because of sin that there's a punishment. Now, they teach that there's different levels based upon the type of choices that you make. They, they talk about Jesus being the Savior. But the one thing they do not teach is this. It's on an individual basis on your choice. If you're going to go to heaven or not, based upon accepting what Jesus did on the cross for them. Because they believe as long as you're baptized into the church, you're automatically going to heaven because they believe in the church as in that, that denomination. There are no denominations in heaven. Thank God for that. Can you imagine all the fights that would be up in heaven if there are all kinds of denominations? You can't even get two Baptists together and argue about something. You got the independent fundamental, you got the independent, independent fundamental, you got the independent fundamental, fundamental, independent. I mean, you got all kinds of things out there. Split after split after split. So once we understand that we have sinned, then we become accountable for our sins. But God loved us so much. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 8. God knew that the beginning of, of, of when he made Adam and Eve, and they disobeyed God. Now remember, they chose to disobey God by listening to the deception of the devil. Now God, after they did that, didn't destroy them. He cast them out of the garden, but he made a way for fellowship by the, by the, the, the killing of the animals to give them the skins, which is a picture of what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us in a spiritual sense. So he still wants fellowship with his people. Since so in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, 
But God commended, that word commended means show, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus knew as the sacrifice, he was coming down to die for sinners. He knew that. God knew that. And that's why he did that. His desire was to come and to seek and to save those that were lost. Another word for lost is a sinner. So Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God, and also as the shepherd, and also as the door, and also as the rock, and as the bread of life, to get people who was created by him to come back and accept his, who he was and what he could do for them. That's why the significance of Matthew chapter 27, chapter 27 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because if Jesus Christ would not have done that, each one of us would have to do the very same thing, and we would not be good enough because our sin, our, our blood is tainted with sin. You see, the aspect about blood is this. On earth, it rots, it spoils. But Jesus' blood doesn't spoil because it's God's blood. And it covers us, and it covers a multitude of sins, the Bible says. So we see that the fact is we got to know that we are sinners. Once we understand we are sinners, then all of a sudden we have to make a choice. We have to either accept God or Jesus or go our own way. It says in Matt, uh, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The two main words that's in this portion of scripture that is vital to understand is this, wages and gift. Now, when I was working for Wichita State, every two weeks I would receive a wage. What was the wage? It was a payment for my actions for two weeks. The difference between a wage and a gift is this. If you have to work for it, it's a wage. But a, a gift is something that you don't have to do anything for, but someone willingly, out of the goodness of their own heart, gives to you, but then there's one thing you got to do. You've got to accept it. You've got to take it as a gift and accept it. That's where Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That gift of God is always out there for people. And he wants people to accept it. For he's not one that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord doesn't want anyone to go to a place called hell. In fact, God or Jesus, people don't go, don't, are not sent to hell because of God. They go to hell because of their personal choices. Not through denomination, not through works, not through giving, not through attendance, not through feeding the homeless or shelter, stuff like that. It's based upon, it's either Jesus or nothing. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says this. Behold, I stand the door knock, if any man hear my voice, and open the door. If any man hear my voice, and open the door. And I've given you an illustration about knocking on a door and the picture of the, the, uh, the, the stained glass pictures of Jesus in the garden. It's beautiful. And in that door, there's no door handle on the outside. The door handle is on the inside. So Jesus knocks and knocks and knocks. How does he knock? Through hearing the gospel story, through a Christian witnessing or testifying or sharing the love of God. He's knocking. If any man hears that and accepts that and opens the door, that's part of it. See, Jesus is a gentleman. He will never force his way into anybody's life. He wants us to willingly invite him in. That's where Romans 10, 13 comes in. 
But if anybody will open that door, he says, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I've had people say, well, I can't get saved until I get my life cleaned up. There's nothing in there that says that he has to wait to uh, have your house cleaned up before he comes in. Because let me just say this, God knows about our lives. He looks beyond the facade of our life. He knows the very, the very deepest recesses of our heart and our life. And he knows the good, bad, and ugly about that. So there's no reason to try to, to put on airs when it comes to the Lord. He says, I will come in with them, and I will sup with him, and he with me. So literally, he will fellowship with people who will invite him in. But the one thing that we need to understand is that once he comes in, look at Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> look at verse 5. Once he comes into your life, Verse 5 says this, let your conversation be without covetousness. Now, the word conversation in the, Old, in the New Testament means lifestyle. So Paul is writing to the Hebrew believers that don't live your life wanting to have everything. Don't be covetous of everything. And be content with such things as you have. have as you have. He says, don't be always looking to have more. Be content with what you have. And then he says this. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So once you invite him to come into your life, he comes in. Now, you shut the door after he comes in the, in, into, into your life. He takes it. He locks the door and says, now I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So what about my life? That's where the start, that's where life starts changing because you have someone to help you. How many times you've had to clean up different things in your life and you've got frustrated because things are not working out like you thought them to be working out? Because we among ourselves can't do it without the Lord's help. It says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so once he comes into our life, he's there forever. Thank God for that. And that's why when we come to the rapture, that when he comes back out of the cloud, it comes in the, in the air, and he calls for us, we're going up there because we're going to be with Jesus forever. So because we are saved, there's some things we need to be thankful for. First of all, we have peace with God. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we read in John, in John chapter 3 that the wrath of God abides on us. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 13, says this. But now is Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished the flesh, in his flesh, the enmity or the enemy, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity divide, and came and preached peace to you which were far off to them that were nigh off. For through him we both have access by one spirit into the Father, now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So we have peace with God. See, we read in John chapter 3 that we have the wrath of God upon us. But when we come to know Christ, he reconciles us to him. Why? Because of what sin has separated us. It is sin's curse. The punishment of sin is separation from God. In fact, if we go to Revelation chapter 20, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 real quick. Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 21, I'm sorry. Chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8 says this, but the fearful. 
Is there a lot of fear out there nowadays? Yes, there is. And unbelieving. Awful lot of folks that don't believe what's at what about the Lord and things like that. And the abominable. The abominable are the things that God severely hates. And murderers. There's a lot of that going on. But the Bible also says in the book of 1 John chapter 3 that if you have that you have hatred in your heart towards another, you have already committed murder in your heart. No different than when Jesus said, if a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her, then he's already committed adultery in his heart against that person. It says this, uh, murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers. Now, when you think about the aspect about sorcerers, you go back to the, the Greek, that word sorcery, sorcerers or sorcery comes from the Greek word pharmakia. And we know what that, what that is in English. It's a pharmacy. So we're dealing with the aspect about drugs and mind-altering things like that. Then it says an idolater. See, what's an idolater? Is that anyone that puts anything between them and God. And all liars. How many times do you have to steal from a bank to be called a bank robber? Once. And so if we want to be, if we don't want, and I don't anything about, I don't want to be called a liar, but if I lie one time, what am I considered? A liar based upon the scriptures. And it says this, shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, the aspect about death is in two phases. One is the physical. Back March 1st, March 1st, my wife took her last breath, breath. Physically, she's no longer alive. That's the first death. And where did death come from? It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's when the consequences of sin. But the second death is separation from God forever. And so when you look at as understanding that God does not want anyone to be separated from him. That's why Jesus was the bridge. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 6. So we go to Jesus. Jesus already paid, the sat, satisfied the, the judgment of God. And then he reconciles, which means he brings us and God together, not because we're good, because the sacrifice satisfied God's judgment. That he brings us together, as we read in Ephesians chapter, chapter 3, now we're part of a family called the family of God. Thank God for that. And so, the importance of being saved is this. Number one is that we are reconciled to God. Whereas God doesn't look at us as sinners, he looks at us as justified because the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our lives. And because we are justified, then we have access to the Father because we are now part of the family of God. Is it important to be saved? Yes, it is. Not just the fact of, of being reconciled to God, but then I have several other points of that. We have peace with God. We get to enjoy God's grace. We have new hope. We have uh, access to God even in our most difficult times. We have God's love in our hearts. And we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, which helps us through all things. But it's important to be saved to know that one day if you close your eyes, yes, we are all bound to, to end up with that first death. All, the Bible says, as a part of man wants to die. All of us are appointed to, to take our last breath, whenever that is. And we don't know when that is. That's the significance of getting things taken care of right away. But you want to avoid the second death, which is separation from God. And how do you get avoid that? By coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. And because of my sins, I'm going to be separated from you. But you love me enough to, to accept me and forgive me of my sins. At this time and at this place, I ask you to come into my life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say what if? There's no what ifs with God. God says it. We do it. It's settled. Forever. What about my life? God already knows about our lives. Do I have to clean my life up? No, that's God's job to help clean that up. So even the maniac Gadara, 
came to Jesus with all full of demons and cuttings and stuff like that. He came to Jesus and Jesus, first of all, forgave him. Then, all of a sudden, he's sitting down with all these people saying, man, that guy's crazy, he's sitting down in his right mind. And then he says, Jesus, I want to spend time with you. I want to go with you. And Jesus says, uh-uh. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord had done for thee and had compassion on thee. See, in God's eyes, there's no level of sin. Because it was one sin, just the fact of disobeying God with Eve that cast him out of the Garden of Eden. So there's no level of sin. It's one sin that brings us away from fellowship with God. And it's one sacrifice that brings us back to God, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin, not sins, the sin of of the world, and that was sin's penalty. And so as we see the world enveloping and all the stuff that's going on, all the chaos, my encouragement, my prayer for you is that if you do not know Christ as personal Savior, today would be the accepted time. Say, I'm already saved, what do I do? Then you need to let other people know that they need to know Christ also because time is short. So I've got all the time in the world. Ask all the people that are in the grave right now. About three weeks ago, I preached a funeral of a, of a 20-some-year-old young man. Full life in front of him, he passed away. I preached funerals for babies. I preached funerals for 80, 90-year-old people. It doesn't matter. Sin is not, death is not a respecter of persons. And I felt impressed so much as a pastor, to encourage you as not just members of the church, but brothers and sisters in Christ, to talk to your family members and pray for them and let them know how much Jesus loves them, how Jesus is willing to accept them just as they are. If he accepts a, a maniac full of the devil, he'll accept anyone. Why? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that through him all might be saved. That's the message. Jesus saves. He'll save those, the Bible says, to the uttermost, to the deepest depths of sin, to the one that lives the most saintly life, that doesn't know Christ, he'll forgive them equally. And we're all part of one great big old family called the family of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With head bowed and eyes closed, Christians praying. It's a different type of message, but I felt it had to get out today. First of all, as we go, and the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Pastor, I know that I know that I'm on my way to heaven. I am born again. Can I see your hands of testimony? God bless you. I appreciate that. Let me put your hands down. Second question is, Pastor, something in the message spoke to my heart. Would you please pray for me? Can I see your hand? My hand's up too, because I know a lot of folks that aren't saved. So what we'll do is we will pray. Then we'll stand. If you're not saved, today be a great day. If you are saved, maybe someone's on your heart right now, that particular name, that somehow, some way, God's saying, you need to pray, you need to witness, you need to do something. Do what God wants you to do. Father, we gave the invitation, we gave the message to the best of our abilities. And Lord, in the most simplest of ways, we tried to explain the significance of being saved. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us all understand that significance. And spread the word. Help us, Lord, to be what you want us to be. We're not perfect, never going to be perfect. And sometimes we're going to slip, sometimes we're going to backslide, but we're always going to be your children. Help us, Lord, as your children, to continue to grow in grace and the nurture and admonition of Jesus Christ. Be each one here, Lord, whatever needs are, please meet them also, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand with head bowed and eyes closed.
If you need to use an old-fashioned altar, just here. Or where you're at, talk to the Lord. You may be seated with head bowed, eyes closed, Christians praying. You at the altar, take your time. Well, praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Folks, I love you. Appreciate you so much. Jesus is coming. And I just pray as a pastor that everyone that has sat under our, under our ministry here, as well as other ministries, that they would know Christ because time is short. And if you know someone, you have loved ones. I've got loved ones, and I'm sure they'll watch this. And they'll probably get a few comments about that, but I'm not worried about their comments because I want them saved. I want them to know Christ. That's why we have Christmas shoeboxes. That's why we send missionaries across the world. That's why the church exists. It's for the gospel. That's why we gather together as brothers and sisters of Christ, the preparation for heaven, but also shining our light into a dark Pittsburgh, Kansas. Can you imagine over 110 churches in this county? Over 110 churches in this county. And our country, our county still needs Christ. That's why we shine the light. That's why we share the gospel. So let's just keep on keeping on for Jesus. It's that important. So don't forget tonight, 5.30, Bible study, and then also Wednesday night prayer and, and Bible study also. Let's all stand as we are dismissed. And so, Brother Bob, can you take us to the Lord's throne? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for all that Jesus has did. And we'll do. Ask, Lord, that you'll help us as we go through our days and help us to keep going and do what we need to do. Just ask this in thy precious name. Amen.